Hello and thank you. Thank you for waiting. Uh, just got in. All right, so I appreciate you for uh, waiting. In addition to the half hour change, uh, waiting five more minutes after that. All right, so this is our last, uh, last hurrah before the final. And um, it's just comprised of two sections. And the theses are pretty straightforward, but it is just still a fascinating subject. And that is after uh, the Northern 19 states defeated the Southern 11 states, how to reconstruct the South, all right? Now remember, moderate Republicans who would not take too strong of a stand against slavery even they said that that the that the South uh, needs to become um, economically um, caught up to speed. All right, uh, this whole monoculture, uh, just you know, uh, the Upper South dependent upon um, tobacco, and the Lower South uh, dependent upon cotton, and uh, and then South Carolina and Louisiana also sugar and rice is just not cutting it. Um, they need to diversify uh, economically. And then the good old boy club with the planter class uh, having complete hegemony or domination uh, over political offices, that needs to change as well. Uh, for all the poor white Southerners, they need to have um, access to land and they need to have access to credit uh, to start businesses and so forth to try to... Um, you know, uh, fashion some semblance of a middle class in the in the South. So you have those um, advocates that were kind of moderate Republicans. And then the radical Republicans, of course, were uh, focused upon the African-Americans and they wanted uh, change for them. And of course, uh, the Americans of the 1800s were more familiar than we are uh, with the fact that, you know, the uh, the Romans, uh, the Greeks and many other civilizations had different levels of citizenship. It wasn't just you either are entitled to the rights and privileges and powers of citizenship or you're not. Uh, you had very variegated uh, gradations of citizenship. So I would make the argument uh, that those who um, wanted the, the absolute basic um, uh, degree of rights given to African-Americans is that they wanted uh, two things. Uh, they wanted um, their right to uh, property, okay? And I don't just mean be able to rent and purchase property, but the right to uh, remuneration, right, for their, their labor, to be paid for their labor, and to be able to save and accumulate those wages, and also um, to uh, be able to, uh, yeah, just to to acquire and, and chase after that American dream, that ever elusive American dream, and to um, have a chance to 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 rise up according to merit, just like white people. Okay. Uh, then the other basic uh, part of an assumed uh, citizenship role uh, would be uh, the protections of citizenship uh, under criminal law. So that if someone were to harm you, uh, you could take them to court and you have the protections of a citizen, right, uh, to have um, to be protected from criminal behavior. So then uh, beyond that, of course, uh, at a higher level, you have suffrage and suffrage, right, is political participation uh, to be able to vote, to be able to run for office as politicians, et cetera. And that's a whole other level. All right. And so, um, and then I would say higher than that, uh, societally would be the social realm and uh, culturally, and that is uh, integration, uh, allow them to uh, be fully integrated in all institutions like schools and churches, et cetera, and, and to be able to intermarry uh, with white people and live amongst them, et cetera. So at any rate, there were all sort of, uh, of different variations in the North. Uh, as far as where, what they wanted for Black people uh, down in the South, all right? But there was one thing that united them, all right? There was one thing that united 
the North, supposedly, according to Eric Foner. Uh, Eric Foner is a very respected historian on this subject. And that was, is that um, they resented the domination, the arrogance, and the political stubbornness of the planter class, of the slave-owning class. Like uh, virtually the whole country uh, wanted to see them get their humble pie and 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 uh, spread some of their power, their influence, their privileges uh, to other people. Okay. And then secondly, right, is that they thought that there ought to be um, at least basic um, rights given to African-Americans on account of how many northern soldiers had died. And of course, that would be over 300,000. OK, and so um, at any rate, uh, you have the assassination of Lincoln and um, the new president, Andrew Johnson. Remember, this is the guy that um, he sees Lincoln uh, haul her over to uh, Frederick Douglass, the black abolitionist, and embrace him and uh, ask him what he thought about his second inaugural speech. And genuinely asking him as an equal, you know, what his advice was, what he could have done better, et cetera. And Andrew Johnson could not hide his disdain. Uh, he couldn't believe that he was on such um, fraternal and warm terms with a black man. He could not believe that he, especially as president, uh, was asking this black man his advice on anything. And so at any rate, uh, Frederick Douglass, after a few moments of just interaction with the vice president, uh, came home and wrote down, uh, this man is no friend of my people. OK, and now suddenly he becomes the president when Lincoln is killed by John Wilkes Booth. So um, he gets in and it happens to be during a congressional recess. OK, so Congress is not sitting in. So uh, he. Uh, begins to do his thing for the reconstruction of the South. And, you know, as far as turning territories into states, right? And that's kind of the closest thing they're doing here because these 11 states, they left formally. So now they have to kind of return to a territory status and re become re-annexed as states again. Uh, you could make the, the the argument pretty easily that this is constitutionally a congressional issue uh, of, of annexing them back. And so the president, him taking this on himself while they're in recess, that's already a red flag to a lot of people. And so uh, he goes ahead with Lincoln's lenient plan. Okay. Now, Lincoln, when he had this lenient plan, see, the idea was, is by the time Lincoln died, he had finally proven uh, his, if not abolitionist, his anti-slavery credentials, okay? And we won't get back into all of that, but we've gone over it. And so when he wanted to show leniency to the South, it appeared and was interpreted publicly as just that, that that's old merciful Abe. He's tired of war. He wants to just make them come back as smoothly and quickly uh, and harmlessly as possible. And he's just a gracious winner, right? But when this new president, Andrew Johnson, uh, issues the same easy way back, uh, people didn't interpret it the same way. They interpret it as his um, secret or not so secret affinity for the South. Because remember, he was a Southerner. He was from Tennessee. Uh, but to him, the the Civil War, one, was about loyalty and patriotism to the country. And two, he wasn't about to fight for a rich slave owner's slaves, or a rich slave owner's right to keep his slaves. Uh, he resented uh, the rich slave owners because he came from abject poverty. Okay? And so at any rate... um. He happened to stay loyal to the Union, and Lincoln thought, I think, in his second run for president that he could, um, you know, that it would look good as far as uh, it would look moderate uh, to uh, to his enemies uh, and um, kind of 
broaden the spectrum. See, I got a Southerner uh, in 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 the cabinet with me, uh, but but a Southerner who's loyal to the Union. So at any rate, um, Andrew Johnson, uh, all he requires is one tenth of the population of each state to come uh, to uh, uh, certain areas and sign their names to be pardoned. It's basically like a, a formal apology uh, for the Civil War. Just one tenth, 10 percent okay, of the population had to come forth to the polls and sign that. And in signing that, they also had to promise to adhere to uh, and acknowledge the 13th Amendment. And the 13th Amendment ended slavery. Okay. So at any rate, um, he gets them to do this rather quickly. And then in the meantime, he said, well, there needs to be law and order in these territories before they become annexed by Congress as states. So I'm going to handpick the governors. When he handpicks the governors, he handpicks racist, white, conservative men. OK. And so there's another strike against him and cause for fear. Uh, his choice of governors. So what do you know? Um, they. Uh, they um, when you, when you had uh, Congress come back, they they capitulated, supposedly that initially. Uh, this Congress capitulated. Uh, they did the role. Uh, they um, they annexed state after state. Not all of them, but they started annexing the states. The South. They the South um, elected uh, had their elections for assemblymen, and they did not open their elections to black men. Okay, and they began creating, amongst other things, black codes. Okay, and the black codes stated that African Americans could not enter this or that profession. Uh, African Americans had to, however, have proof of uh, employment uh, at uh, two different times of the year. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to put them right back on the plantations. And now technically they have to pay them, right? Because they agreed to the 13th Amendment but even that, they find a way to get around, okay? So then what they do is they start just putting out a, uh, a plethora of just unnecessary um, laws. Uh, you have like um, uh, loitering and trespassing. Well, the thing is, is African-Americans had nowhere to go. And most of them have been separated from family members. So they're traveling around looking for their family members. So the moment they're caught by authorities now uh, walking along someone's uh, property, uh, they're captured, they're arrested. They give them an exorbitantly high fine that they know that the, the black man cannot uh, pay. And then what do you know? They have a planter pay the fine for them. And they go and work for the planter to work the fine money off, right? They call it debt pay ownage. And so as they work there, anything they broke, they would take it out of their, uh, of their income. They found ways to just keep them indebted and uh, owing money uh, to their uh, planters. Some went even so far as to give first notice to their old masters and let them have a first shot at paying uh, the, the, the trespassing debt of their ex-slave uh, to literally get their ex-slave back on their plantation. Uh, there is a gentleman at UC Davis uh, who is an excellent professor, African-American man, and um, he uh, uh, introduced me to a book called Slavery in All But Name, and, it, and a lot of it uh, a lot of this is covered in it, okay? So that's what it really was. It was slavery in everything but name. Um, so also in the Black Codes, uh, they could not uh, take loans. Uh, they could not carry guns. They could not gather in a party of more than, um, than uh, some, some of them were 50 people. Some were fewer than that. Um, uh, or that literally became illegal. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, uh, they had no schools that they could send their kids to uh, because, in fact, they had apprenticeship laws uh, whereby uh, they said that the kids should become apprenticed to a trade. And what do you know? What was the main trade they should be apprenticed to is to, to field work. And so they would have the kids working for a planter on his plantation. And the dads, uh, the ex-slave dads, were furious because, you know, they had just won the war and they just felt like, you know, they were starting to become um, kind of kings of their own domain in their own houses, no longer living in slave quarters. And now this is happening. So then in addition to that, uh, the uh, Congress passes a couple laws, all right? One was to continue the Freedmen's Bureau. And remember, the Freedmen's Bureau came down to adjudicate or referee disputes between black and white Southerners and also to tend to the needs and legally protect African Americans, right? So it had done quite good uh, by the during the, the end part of the war and so forth. Uh, they established a lot of freedmen schools uh, for the black kids, et cetera. And it was vetoed by the president, the continuation of the Freedmen's Bureau, because he said that it was racist because it catered to the needs of the black race and not the white. Then in addition to that, they had a basic Civil Rights Act of 1866 that covered the basic bottom level of citizenship, saying that um, African American are to enjoy their access to property, right? They're to be remunerated or paid for their labor, and they're able to buy, rent, property, etc. And he, um, President uh, Andrew Johnson, uh, vetoed that one as well. And to a lot of people, they saw that as very moderate, okay? And then in addition to that, there was a, uh, a committee, a Senate committee, uh, that decided to uh, send some people down to um, analyze what was going on in the South. And they came back with nothing but terrible news, and the press got a hold of it. Uh, there was a lot of um, uh, white on black violence. Um, I have it here somewhere where there were like, in one year, there were over 500 murders in Texas, a black man uh, by white men ostensibly, and not one single white suspect was declared guilty. They all got away with it. And the Freedmen's Bureau, they were furious. Because uh, that's what they wanted to do is to ensure justice for the African Americans, and the Southern states were kicking the Freedmen's Bureau out and telling them that this is their state, this is none of their business. And so, um, so when they came back, and then matter of fact, some of the very members of the Senate committee were beaten themselves because it was clear to the people in the South that they were outsider Yankees from the North, and so they beat them. So when they came back up. Right uh, there, especially when the press got a hold of this and everything, what began the change was, were the 1866 congressional elections. OK, uh, during those elections, what many people did in the Republican Party, this, the expression they used was um, wave the bloody shirt. OK, and I think, you know, what I'm talking about is by in by waving the bloody shirt, they're telling the northern population, reminding them, 300,000 of our boys died, and they died for nothing. The South is, quote, unrepentant. They're not sorry. They're, they haven't changed one bit. They're moving around the 13th Amendment, and, and uh, they're awful down there. Everything is awful, and it hasn't changed. And they need to be put in their place. So finally, this never happened before, nor during the Civil War. Finally, you get a majority of radical Republicans elected into Congress. 
now it's time for war. Okay. So they start off and they take role in both houses, the uh the you know, House of Reps and the Senate. And they don't say a single Southerner's name. And then the Southerners, you know, kind of stand up and say, wait a bit, what about us? We're here. And they said, No, you don't exist. No, we don't acknowledge you. They said, You guys are territories again. Uh, we don't acknowledge you as states. So they made him go backwards and go back as territories. Then they said, oh, and by the way, we are choosing, in the meantime, your governors. And they chose uh, hardcore union military men uh, who wanted to put the South in its place. Okay. Uh, and they gave them power to declare martial or military law uh, over the South. Okay. Then they said, oh, and by the way, you not only have to abide by the 13th Amendment, but you have to abide also by the 14th and the 15th. Uh, the 14th, right, was huge. Said that anyone born or naturalized as an immigrant in any state is entitled to all the rights, privileges, and protections of citizenship anywhere in the Union. Okay? And then they said... Uh, in the 15th, in case it's not clear, rights, protections, and privileges of citizenship to anyone born here or naturalized is to include suffrage, political participation, uh, voting and running for office. And they said, and it can't not be abridged by having been a slave, by color, etc. So at any rate, uh, they make them sign those. Then they also send the Union soldiers back into the South uh, as like a symbol that they are like an occupied country, okay, with soldiers down there. And some of the soldiers were black, all right, which was a, a great affront to the dignity and pride of the South. And so at any rate, um, when this happened uh, and they had elections – and they allowed African Americans to uh, actually vote, actually run for office, right? Then it was amazing. Then you had like 21 black congressmen. You had like uh, 600 at least um, uh, black state legislators that were elected into office now. Okay. Oh, and by the way, Part two or B of the 14th Amendment stated that if you um, promised to, uh, if you at any time given a, a sworn on oath to uh, protect the Constitution, and then you had subsequently after that joined the rebellion, you were deprived of your citizenship. The fancy word is disenfranchised. You're disenfranchised for two years. So guess what? That's anybody who was a military leader, a politician. So basically, the old elite of the South are now deprived of citizenship rights for two years. Okay? So now slaves uh, begin, uh, uh, ex-slaves, freedmen, begin voting, right? And according to Eric Foner, they kind of had a uh, uh, a natural aristocracy of their own. Uh most uh, in the first year or two, you see a pattern of most of the black men uh, being voted in um, had never been slaves. Uh, they had uh, they had been freedmen because remember they always had um, uh, freedmen enclaves uh, in certain cities throughout the South. Right, that one way or another, one generation or another, uh, someone had been granted manumission or freedom. And then those people had children and they had children. And so sometimes you had three, four generations uh, born uh, free black people, free black Americans. Okay. And what they had to do is they had to insulate themselves. Uh, they established their own black schools. They established their own uh, black businesses with their own black clientele, et cetera. But they definitely had a way of, 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 of um, you know, carrying themselves that they felt like they had been prepared, better prepared than the slaves uh, to run things uh, for their fellow black community. 
And um, so you had that kind of uh, happen at first. All right. But supposedly by 1868, by like the second, third year uh, of this radical or congressional phase of Reconstruction, they began uh, uh, voting in more ex-slaves who, who were not even literate. Uh, of course, it wasn't their fault. Uh, they had been field slaves uh, their whole lives. And now uh, they had to you know, hire a, a scribe uh, to read and write for them. And um, and but they still made their own decisions and so forth as as either congressmen or or assemblymen in the states, etc. All right. And so uh, you had some uh, who really, really stood out. Uh, there was a uh, Francis Cardoso. He supposedly uh, Francis Cardoso was supposedly a. Um, an economic genius. And he also was very, very, he had a lot of integrity. Like every every penny was accounted for when he dealt with a budget. Um, you had uh, Blanche K. Bruce. Uh, Blanche K. Bruce uh, was a sophisticated looking guy. And he, um, he was basically called the father of Mississippian black education. Okay. And um, he was very well read. And um, and he established a lot of schools for black kids and uh, was a superintendent over all the state of Mississippi. And but he ended up rising all the way to the Senate. Um, you had uh, Hiram Revels. Hiram Revels kept people on their toes. Uh, he said from time to time that there ought to be um, uh, land redistribution uh, because of the unrequited labor. Right. That years and years of slaves given all this labor and they got nothing in return. And so that it, that that made it fair for them to receive uh, labor or, or I'm sorry, land. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, you had that. You had a guy named Robert Smalls and he spoke for the 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 um, the slaves that had been out in the fields. And he, too, like really just kind of um, told it like it was. And uh, and made strong demands, and um, and just a, a very intelligent guy. So at any rate, despite all that, right? What what did they accomplish though? Well, for one, right, they were elected along with um, white Republicans, but the Republicans kind of sweep the house, swept the house uh, for a few years, okay? Because they were their their party had won the Civil War. Uh, their party was the party that wanted to help the African Americans, right, etc. So the Southern whites who adhered to the Republican Party, which weren't too many of them, right, because most Southern whites were Democrats, uh, they were seen as traitors to the other Southern whites, and they were called scalawags. But some of them were elected into office, but more in number were white. Republican men from the North who traveled down into the South during Reconstruction, okay? And because the South at this point was at the mercy of the North and was at, you know, it's kind of in a real kind of humiliated state, uh, these men were called uh, a derisive term uh, carpetbaggers, right? Because they supposedly uh, sometimes carried their stuff with them down South in carpet bags. But it, it came to mean something entirely, you know, uh, independent. And that was is that uh, ruthless profiteers who uh, were out for their own enrichment and, and out to uh, uh, to um, like pirates to enrich themselves at the expense of the suffering South. So at any rate, when those three demographics uh, for about three years were the main ones that were elected into office, um, it was called the hated triumvirate uh, by uh, by the racist white South in the press. Okay, and so at any rate, they um, what did they do? Well, for one, uh, they broke down the domination of the planter class. They just did. Um, they by themselves getting elected into office and so forth. They opened it up for other people in the future to be elected into office besides, you know, 
the um that that planter class. They also uh, ensured that bankers and bank syndicates and so forth, some from Europe, some from the north, uh, came down to the south to offer credit to uh, an extensive, expansive, more uh, a bigger part of the population. Okay, and so uh, so they they granted access to the American dream, right? Because it takes money to make money. You want to start a business. You want to start uh, cash crop farming. You got to start with a with a loan, and they're making that happen. Okay. They also um, encouraged diversification. Uh, they brought in several different uh, uh, different industries of mills or early factories uh, coming into the several southern states. So it was the beginning of, of beginning beginnings of diversification uh, in the South as well. And then what they also did is that they established um, a lot of uh, safety net uh, legislation. Right. And by safety net. Right. Like uh, for those who may who may fall at the bottom of society somewhere, something to catch them. So, uh, for instance, right, they wanted um, they were already dealing uh, th this early, you guys, uh, with the notion of minimum wages, although it didn't go through. But they, they dabbled with that idea. Um, but they wanted uh, public education for all kids, and they wanted it to be integrated, black and white. Uh, they wanted hospitals. Uh, they wanted asylums for uh, the uh, psych, you know, psych, psychologically uh, uh, ailing. Um, they wanted um, uh, prison reform. Uh, they established uh, places for uh, orphans, orphan children. But the problem is, right, is all, a lot of these are great ideas but they cost money. And the problem is, is their voters were so stingy because you're talking about libertarian Southerners who don't like to be taxed. And they always have wanted small government. And so when they ran into that dilemma, they tried to find, you know, expedient ways to, to spend, spend that money, to get that money. And so, yes, it is true that some of them uh, engaged in illegal activities. All right. So you have, um, uh, goodness, uh, graft, right. Where you, uh, you join a meeting as a, as a politician and you hear about an area that's going to become developed, uh, next season. And so you move on it or you tell a family member or a friend to move on it. Uh, to buy that property before anybody else knows about it, right? Like kind of like insider trading and let them profit from that inside information. So graft happened. Uh, and of course, bribery. Uh, they had, you know, stuff as simple as uh, trying to, to get a, a running sewage system and a running water system and uh, public transportation, uh, railroads. Uh, they, they had multiple... Uh, companies vying to provide those for their cities and so how do you pick you know which one do you pick well sometimes they pick the one that bribed them the highest amount of money okay so that sometimes did happen all right and then sometimes they had a fancy name for it and i can't recall but sometimes what people did especially down in the south is they um they mixed private and public funds right especially if they were kind of wealthy uh, they sometimes mix their own wealthy money uh, with the state revenue money and, you know, sometimes using the people's state revenue money uh, to buy their daughter a new chariot and horses or something, you know. So at any rate, but W.E.B. Du Bois, when he writes on this, his famous history of Reconstruction, he says, yeah, I found evidence of some of that. He says, but I challenge anybody to show me that the African-American level of corruption is even remotely as high as the white level of corruption at that time. Because you see, we're talking about like the 1870s now, and this is the beginning of what they what um, uh, was called uh, the, the Gilded Age, right? And by Gilded Age, they say it's 
it looks glittery and gold and it looks nice on the outside, but you scratch the surface and it's corroded just beneath the surface, right? There's a lot of corruption and everything just beneath it. And that's what was happening everywhere in our country. Okay. But of course, right, the Southern press runs with this and says, Negro misrule, Negro misrule. And they've run their states out of money. And what do the white Republicans do? Is they throw the black Republicans under the bus. And say, well, we won't be irresponsible like the Negroes. Uh, vote for us and we'll be fiscally responsible. And they try to save themselves from that stigma. And so when they didn't unite, that was the beginning of the end of, of Reconstruction. Okay? So what I'm saying here, right, is that the zeal to change the South was only as strong as the antagonism that was felt toward our president. Okay? That if it had been more genuine, if it had been more lasting, like like we really genuinely wanted to fundamentally change um, the South, especially for Black Americans, that we we could have made it through this, these these calls of, of corruption, we could have made it, but instead, right, that zeal was an equal and opposite reaction to the president's uber conservative reconstruction efforts, right? And so they waved the blaze shirt and we just wanted to make sure that enough was done to change the South at least a little bit so that our guys, our boys had, didn't, had not fought and died for nothing, okay? And then you add to that 12 years, 12 years is a long time to forget about something. We got the robber barons going on by now. We got uh, the um, the the Sioux and the other tribes in the West and the war, the Indian Wars in the West going on at this time. Okay, we got the cowboy era going on in the West as well. So all that's going on. Okay, and um, and then in addition to that, what what ended it formally is we had uh, so the North kind of lost interest, and then. Um, the president, who was a Republican, who should have known better, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, he and a guy from New York uh, had the most electoral points, but not, neither had a majority. So it goes to the House, says the Constitution. So when it went to the House, Hayes promised the House, who had a lot of Southerners, if you choose me, Instead of this guy from uh, Samuel Tilden from New York, he said, I will remove the troops from the South and let the South be. And that was known as the Compromise of 1877. And so they did. They chose him. He had the troops leave. And that was that was it. Right. That's why when Martin Luther King uh, with uh, SNCC, and these other civil rights groups in the 1960s uh, come into the South, uh, it's sometimes called America's Second Reconstruction because it's like they had to start all over again. All right. There was white backlash. The KKK uh, came back with a vengeance. Uh, the people who had um, lost citizenship for two years the two years passed, they lapsed. So now they could run again, the old elite. So these are all reasons why uh, uh, Reconstruction did not end well. Okay. And this one's very simple. Number one is, is very much full of uh, factual information. Number two is very just argumentative based with not nearly as many facts, okay? And so with number two, I'm just saying a very simple point, and that is, is that legal remedies would never have been enough, that you needed to, uh, remember we talked about it, like uh, historians, uh, they separate the categories of history into um, 
political, economic, and social. Well, sometimes the social realm, right, when it comes to culture, beliefs, ideology, sometimes the social realm can be the most resistant to change, can be the most stubborn, okay? Politically, you can make a law that changes something rather radically and abruptly overnight. Economically, you could have the, the abrupt change of the Great Depression of 29. Okay, but socially, people who call them the N word and look down upon them and believe in the Sambo image, that's not going to be rooted out in a night, in a single day. Okay, and that's all I'm saying. So then what I do is I go after, I say, first of all, the people that did show them some help outwardly, legally, that uh, they didn't have their heart in the right place to begin with. Obviously, the president, uh, Andrew Johnson, but also a lot of the leaders of the Union Army that liberated the slaves uh, felt like they were uh, a nuisance and um, were not, you know, enlightened in their outlook at all. Okay. That maybe there is a little bit of truth in some cases at least, uh, to William Dunning's thesis, uh, D-U-N-N-I-N-G. Uh, Dunning was a Southern historian, and he said that, I think that the North did what it did for Black people simply to spite and weaken and punish the White South. That's something to think about. So at any rate, it goes on. And I say, granted, Ulysses Grant, he was coming around. Grant was coming around. At first, he too was annoyed by them, but he started showing more of a decent concern and made more uh, gestures and efforts to help them and enrich their lives as the war went on. You could find evidence for that. And the 13th through 15th Amendments were wonderful, sure. And then I said, also, I showed agency of African-Americans. And yes, they did great things. They refused to work. They ran away. They joined the Union Army. They, they formed fraternal organizations. They formed these Lincoln and Liberty Leagues where they would meet like at train depots and churches and uh, read newspapers and have people uh, that were literate uh, educate the others on what was going on and what their rights were. Um, etc. Right. So there was a lot of that going on. Uh, like I said, uh, during radical reconstruction, uh, they subsidized uh, public schools, orphanages, prisons, workhouses. But I said, what about the social realm? So I said, first of all, what about what about Christianity? Right. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Unc Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it's pretty easy to see the parallels with Uncle Tom, uh, with Jesus Christ. She models Uncle Tom as a black Jesus Christ. Okay. And supposedly, right, remember I told you that the president met her and he said, so you're the little lady who started this war? He thought so highly of the influence of her book. Why, why did the South not come up with any type of, um, you know, evangelical integration? Uh, between black and white Southerners, right? Using Christianity. Christianity, as I as I covered with slavery, can be a, a great source of um, of unification, a brotherhood, etc., of equality. Um, then you also have um, what about the intelligentsia? Uh, uh, the power of the written and spoken word. What about intelligentsia? Uh, why didn't they, you know, with uh, magazines, newspapers, uh, novels, people were so into the sentimental novel in the mid-1800s. Uh, why didn't someone write to try to make a change? And of course, what am I talking about with all this, with the evangelical Christians and with the intelligentsia and what they're writing, is why didn't they try to aim toward the kids and get them to stop being racist? 
right? Why didn't they try to pull this stuff out by the root? By that ugly racist root? Instead of simply just having 13th through 15th amendments and civil rights acts. To me, the social realm is pivotal. You can't ignore it. Right? But I had others. I could have sworn. Um, so, yeah, public education. So they dropped the ball with public education. They dropped the ball with Christianity. They dropped the ball with intelligentsia. They dropped the ball with a Union Army coming down. But they had chances to try to change the social fabric of the South, especially aiming toward the youth and teaching them tolerance and teaching them egalitarianism. But these different demographics kind of just dropped the ball. They didn't seem to do that. All right, so um, do you guys have any comments or questions? No. Okay, thank you, Julia. Anybody else? I'm good, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if 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 you guys are okay with it, I'm gonna go ahead and let you go. Okay, that it was just those two sections. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for always being there. I love seeing the same familiar names. Okay, and I hope you're noticing. I'm I'm little by little catching up, uh, trying to play catch up with grading, and that you guys are getting your extra five points. You guys deserve it every time. Thank you. Have a good day, Professor. You too. Thank you, hon. All right. All of you have a good day. Thank you. Nice Thank day. You. you too.